Hey guys, this is Alexander Williamson with The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. Today we're going to be talking about something that doesn't get talked a whole lot about, and that is live baby brine shrimp. Now wait, I know you're thinking, well this gets talked about a lot. There's brine shrimp hatcheries all over the place, there's new uh, advances in technology with how we do that, and there's even new prepackaged versions, there's frozen versions. That's all true. That's all stuff I still use, but it needs to be used with a proper knowledge base of what it is you have and what it can do for your aquariums, for your fish, for your fry, and what are the downsides? Because there are some serious issues that are always seem to be glossed over when looking into this, when looking into advertising of this, and when trying to understand why it is that these things are kind of almost kept secret. It's almost a conspiracy of sorts uh, in that it's well-known information, and it has been since the 1970s, but there are far, far better sources of food. You could be feeding your fish, but it does come down to what's practical and what is economically feasible for you. However, some of those assumptions were made all the way back at the turn of the 20th century. That's 19th into the 20th century. And you get companies starting around fish clubs like the San Francisco Fish Club, which actually started uh, harvesting brine shrimp from the San Francisco Bay. They were a plentiful source of food that you could feed to fresh or saltwater fish. Shortly after, uh, there was uh, using shrimp from, brine shrimp that is, from all over different sources around the world. And later on, sea monkeys became popular, and those are Artema napoli I, <laughs> Napoli I, I always forget that I, uh, and they are basically just a different uh, line or strain of them than what's found in the wild that's a little hardier for your aquarium. But when that came out, people really began to get familiar with these creatures, understand them, understand the word brine shrimp in the fish hobby, and also understand that it could be shipped, it could be packaged, and it could be sent around the world. Well, things are ever-changing, and now we have aquariums that aren't sterile little boxes where we're trying to keep, you know, them gravel vacuumed every day. Many of us have nature aquariums where we don't gravel vacuum them at all, and there's all sorts of micro foods, microflora and fauna, plankton, algae, all sorts of stuff in there for them to eat. So does it still make sense to be using brine shrimp? And if you've seen my videos, you know that I still do hatch brine shrimp, but for specific situations. So let's go over their life cycle, and then I can tell you why what's going on doesn't make sense and what you really haven't been told about the nutritional profile of these creatures and why they're really not the best option in many different situations. Let's get into that now. All right, everybody, let's talk a little bit about brine shrimp and their life cycle so you can understand what it is I'm talking about. So brine shrimp, and this is also just useful to know if you're hatching them or interested, but brine shrimp have a pretty uh, interesting life cycle with 14 to 17 different stages. This whole uh, description, which is interactive, you can click on, you can read more information about each stage and uh, about the anatomy at each stage and the uh, activity, and interestingly enough, then you can look up the nutritional information um, related to that, uh, but it is available online, and I will link to that uh, in the description. So if we continue looking at this, Brine shrimp, they hatch in the spring, and they live their life as these uh, creatures. So this is the adult brine shrimp, or Artema uh, napoli. <laughs> and uh, these are what their eggs look like, or what they hatch from. So they are a really fascinating animal in that they can have eggs and they can carry somewhere between 30 and 80 of these at a time and they can hatch them daily so they can have that many eggs every few days and the females and males once they mate 
they, the female will have eggs. She will lay eggs, and if it's good weather, if it's warm, if it's spring or summer or just the uh, beginning of fall, they will hatch into active little brine shrimp babies or uh, instars or, or uh, baby brine shrimp, if you want to call them that. So if the weather is cold... And if there's not enough food, like the algae and the microflora and fauna that they will eat in their environment, then they will lay these harder uh, little eggs that can last up to 25 years. And that's also what they lay when it's too cold, when the water's freezing and all the adults have died, there are only these cysts left. So even in the time, the six months that these can live, if everything goes well, uh, there is some of the year that they're probably living um, in the stage of the cyst or in one of these uh, instar stages. So we can get more into that in another video, but the basics of it are that some hatch right away and they're active. However, one crucial little fact about them is they have a yolk sac, just like any animal that hatches out of an egg. And if you are looking at their nutritional profile, they have the highest nutrition per gram right here, right when they hatch. And the problem with the ones that are in the cyst casings, or the dormant cyst casings, is that this is made out of a very, very hard uh, material called uh, chiron, and it is so hard that uh, it can actually clog a fish's stomach and cause problems. Now, they do sell these type of cysts online. They're usually the cheaper end brine shrimp, but they also sell these already ready to hatch any moment uh, active uh, eggs or cysts as well. And then they sell a decapsulated form of these dormant ones, and that's what's most popular probably in our hobby um, for feeding the live baby brine shrimp or feeding dead baby brine shrimp that were just hatched. So, like I said, when they live in a shell, they have all this energy, and as soon as they hatch out of it, they need to find food. However, they're not fully grown. So they need to grow, and they need to grow a stomach. They can't even look for food to get the omega-3s and omega-6s and all the different fatty acids and uh, vitamins that will be in their body for our fish. They can't even get those because they don't even have the right mouth parts or even a stomach at this point. And what can happen is that they can go 12 hours and then their stomach will uh, develop and they can start grazing and that's in ideal conditions however if you're hatching them in your brine shrimp hatchery they hatch they're at their peak protein for their mass and then they're this empty void basically like this here and for 12 to 36 hours they're in a state where they need to graze well when you have a brine shrimp hatchery you either need to use it right away within those 12 hours of hatching uh, or you need to use it after they're old enough that they are juveniles and they have begun to graze and they can actually eat some of those things to get that enhancement. So if you are savvy about brine shrimp, you will know that they actually uh, are often fed at at these stages here, at the Napoliar stages. And at these stages, they haven't been eating anything in our brine shrimp hatchery. And there is no algae, there is no plankton or other little critters for them to consume, or plants for that matter, uh, in our hatchery. It's just salt and water and maybe, you know, dechlorinate or whatever else you treat your water with. But that's it. So you either need to let them grow up and feed them, and that's where some people, especially with uh, bigger species of fish, will use uh, enhancers. So you can buy things that you can put into their uh, hatching container to enhance them. So that's one way fish stores can make money off of these shrimp. 
is they can also sell that enhancer. They sell you the eggs, they sell you the 40 or $50 brine shrimp hatcher, they sell you an air pump, they sell you air hoses, they sell you these, and they're selling you the eggs from the source as well. Well, it turns out, re recent studies have shown, you can just, in good condition, in fresh water, um, or, or rather in salt water that is consistent and in lakes, uh, rather than oceanic water, you can take the species that are from regions that would generally have only a season they can survive in half the year, well, you can take them and you can actually feed them uh, these enhancers or various food or, heck, build a whole ecosystem uh, or reef so they can survive, and then they can be a very, very good source of food. In fact, then they're really hard to beat copepods and a few other um you know uh, little critters daphnia and things like that are the only things that rate higher pound for pound uh in in the uh baby fish food world and the other problem that these things have is that when they're hatching from their shell it takes energy to get out of that shell so unless you buy the kind that generally costs a little bit more is considered premium that is decapsulated they actually use up a bunch of this energy here you see that's in that yolk sac just trying to get through the shell now not dechlorinating your water can actually help erode this shell slightly and that will help them quick uh get out quicker also keeping the temperature at that 72 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit or so range, that's another thing that can help because it keeps their metabolism optimized. However, that's their optimal condition and you want to feed those within 12 hours of hatching. Now, if you don't do that, then you want to grow them up into this and then you want to give them enhancers that they can eat. Otherwise, you're giving them empty vessels and so there's no point in growing up your brine shrimp uh, to feed to your fish. It's, it's basically feeding them saltines or empty calories. Um, they're not even as useful as carbs because they cannot digest necessarily uh, the chitin and the things that are in their exoskeleton. They don't get any nutrients from that. It just passes through many fish. So this is a, a pretty thorough understanding, I hope, of kind of what they go through in the wild and why why they're not the nutritional um, amazing wonder kid that they've been told to be. Uh, it's because it's, it's hard, one, to ship the adults full of nutrients. You have to keep them alive. Once you freeze them, what happens is the cell walls all break and it turns mushy and you lose some of the cell structure unless it's... It, unless it's deep frozen, dry frozen, vacuum sealed, and then the price goes up. Now, there are places that do sell some of these, but they're not going to be your local pet store, most likely. You might be able to special order them, but I highly recommend checking out places like uh, Brine Shrimp Direct or people who specialize in aquaculture. Now, this is the even darker part, and the... I suppose the biggest bummer of all of this about brine shrimp that we're going to get into now, and that is that there are grades of brine shrimp. Great, Alex. There are grades of brine shrimp. We know that. You told us that. There's decapsulated and there's premium. Oh, right. But there's also four other. There is premium. There is high grade. Then there is aquaculture grade, and then there is hobbyist or aquarium grade. Now, aquaculture grade can be gotten sometimes by places like Brine Shrimp Direct and things like that. The top two grades you will never see on the consumer market. They're for aquariums, and simply there's just not big enough demand or people asking for those that they have enhanced them, they've fed them a really balanced, nutritious diet, and they understand the profile of what our baby fish need. So the real bummer is that they're selling us basically the worst of what they have to offer. And just to get the mid-range, we're paying a whole lot more uh, than we should be, honestly. And who's to say what we should be paying for brine shrimp, right? Well, I am for one in that 
they uh, have a good market. Okay, Alex, what do you mean they have a good market? Well, once they have a whole ocean where they can get them if they're looking for the salt water type that's in the ocean salt water. If they're looking in the quote unquote freshwater salt water, which doesn't make sense, I know, but inland salt water lakes and oceans or seas, then they have uh, the, the kind that we're used to seeing uh, most of the time, the Napoli, and those are the ones that, you know, sea monkeys come from. There's some from Canada, there's some from China, there's some from uh, Utah, obviously. Now, most people get theirs from Utah in the United States, and in most of Europe, for that matter, unless you're getting them frozen, in which case you may get them from the San Francisco Brine Shrimp Company, or you may get them from someone like Brine Shrimp Direct, and in that case, you're going to have to see where they're from. Now, the really interesting thing is that out of all the sources that we could be feeding our fish brine shrimp from, the Great Lakes, of, or the Great Salt Lake, rather, is probably the worst of all of them. It is not a good ecosystem. It is a very extreme ecosystem, and there isn't an entire food chain to the degree that there are in the oceans, or other lakes even, for that matter. There are lots of different types of these brine shrimp creatures and lots of different strains or subspecies lines of them possible. Some hatch at different temperatures, some are different colors, some eat different things. And it turns out in most recent studies they've done, and that's 20-year-old studies now, that the San Francisco Bay brine shrimp are literally two times better in every way and I can show you guys a chart of the nutrition uh, info in the description also but they're liter literally two times better and pound for pound uh, they're almost as good as something like salmon belly fat for nutrition when they're coming from the San Francisco Bay and they've had a full life out on the water uh, rather than being newborn brine shrimp well put a pin in that because those parents pass on energy to their babies, right? The mother has to put her energy into creating eggs. Well, they're only as good as the energy that the parents had and the nutrition that the parents had. So that means that these malnourished varieties that ex exist in s extreme uh, settings, which may be great because they can survive in someone's crazy hectic fish room uh, and they can hatch at a pretty favorable rate, that doesn't mean they are the type that will hatch and be nutritious for your fish to the max. In fact, there's a lot of empty calorie there. And so that is another major downside or part that nobody seems to be talking about uh, when they hype up these products and things. In fact, if you can hatch Daphnia, even in a little aquarium like I've got Daphnia hatching in this aquarium up here and over in here we have some in with fish, just enough moss that there's fish, there's algae, uh, and I feed it green water for the Daphnia. Um, vinegar eels, uh, seed shrimp, copepods, other, other live cultures are great. And if you're going to use brine shrimp, you pretty much need to supplement with these other things. Brine shrimp are great in that they move around when they're live, but they're terrible in that they die in fresh water within 6 to 12 hours at best. They're not a optimal nutrient source as is so often advertised. If they're frozen, their nutrient profile has gone down uh, a substantial amount. Some say as much as 50%, but most studies seem to show about 20 or 30 percent decrease in uh, some of those fats and uh, more delicate nutrient uh, vitamins and, uh, and uh, minerals that they store in their, their contents of their stomach and their organs, basically. So I think that we should be able to buy this top line grade of brine shrimp. That's my personal opinion. and. Uh, I think that they should let us know the truth about this. The truth that feeding Daphnia is more optimal. That feeding bloodworms is going to be far more protein if they're alive. Um, 
those have issues of their own. I mean, frozen bloodworms and things, a lot of times they've been soaked in salty water or brined so that they swell up, so that they take in more salt, and uh, or, or more water rather, and so that they actually are heavier, and then when frozen, it's just water weight. So they do tricks like that with all sorts of frozen foods, and it's really important to get a good source when you're getting live foods for your fish. Right here, I've been kind of beating around the bush and teasing it, but shrimp, even just a neocaridina shrimp, or a crayfish, a CPO crayfish, um, those are actually just as good as uh, any sort of uh, industrial salmon uh, byproducts that you find as fish meal in most foods. However, they dry them out and you don't get that active chase reflex or the, uh, the other benefits of them eating and cleaning your ecosystem while they are alive uh, with <laughs> fish meal. So those are all just things I really hope you guys can kind of think about a little bit and maybe help you decide if you really want to spend $50 on hatching them and you want to spend uh, $20 on the type of shrimp. You know, if 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 you want to spend your money anywhere, I think it's easily easy to say that it is best spent on getting high quality uh, eggs to start with, and then essentially it's best to either buy them decapsulated and don't even bother hatching them, just feed them right away. But if you have a fish that needs that motion, that that movement to eat, then I would highly recommend that you uh, use something like the live brine shrimp and feed it within 12 hours and no longer than that of when you uh, hatch it. If you don't do that, you better be using the enhancers and then you start spending more money, more time, more effort, and you have to simultaneously be running these batches and whole little aquariums for just your food stores. And to me, that doesn't sound like uh, the most fun or fulfilling uh, <laughs> option of all the ones out there. So I just want you guys to remember that and also to to remember the fact that actually fish clubs used brine shrimp because they were a cheap way to raise money. They were practically free and they could sell them to people inland over a hundred years ago to feed their fish. Things have changed, international flight, all sorts of, uh, you know, these, for instance, a black water um, biome type tank. And, you know, people raise things different ways now. They're not the little glass boxes that they once used to be. So make sure you're informed. Don't take my word for it. Go online and research, but make sure you're informed before you start feeding live cultures to your fish because it can substantially increase how they grow and on the flip side of that it can devastate how they survive some baby fish just from eating uh, Great Lake baby brine shrimp that were older than that 12 hour optimal period especially any sort of marine fish but even just freshwater fish they studied 20 different species in a study which I can link on my members page in the community tab. But they studied 20 different fish and they found that uh, they had an issue with poor nutrition which would cause their spines not to form correctly, the nerves in their eyes and the cells in their eyes not to form correctly. So they couldn't even find more food to eat to get the nutrition in the first place. And they found that they had a uh, die-off rate that was double, triple, sometimes even 10 times higher than the fish that were out feeding normally in the open ocean with a varied diet. Now, that's an extreme, and I'm not trying to just scaremonger, but this is an important subject, and if you're into balancing your aquarium and providing an entire ecosystem, especially if you're into non-filtered tanks and, and biome tanks and things like that, Wallstead method tanks, these issues are so critical because the food you put into your fish is going to be the food that you put into your plants. You know, the type of nutrition, the type of minerals, all that stuff has to be contained within your ecosystem. And that is why it is so crucial to know these things and to know 
what's a fair price to pay or look into what's a fair price to pay and when you find out you can buy them bulk for such low prices as you know seven dollars for eight ounces or something like that whereas in other stores mass big box stores and local fish shops for that matter they're sold at five ten times that rate in these one or two ounce packets very frequently for the lowest grade that's on the market it becomes slightly frustrating and yes they need ways which they can make money and keep the lights on at their store but transparency at the end of the day is very important to me and i hope it is to most other hobbyists as well especially if you stuck around with me this long nerding out on brine shrimp so thanks for tuning in guys and i will talk to you next time on the secret history living in your aquarium Please hit that like button if you like this episode. Uh, if you didn't, you didn't like it, hit that thumbs down and get out of here. Go enjoy your life. You don't need to be here. You don't like me or my content. Or maybe you don't like my content, but you like me. In that case, either way, go enjoy life in the world. All right, guys. I'll talk to you next time. Take it easy. Bye.